From the 1920s, Britain's railways were run by four giant companies. The London and North Eastern Railway ruled the North East. The London, Midland and Scottish the North West. The Great Western dominated the West Country and Wales. And the Southern Railway ran the South East. After nationalisation in 1948, when these big four railway companies merged to form British Railways, one of the new organisation's first goals was the eradication of steam from the network. Britain had hung on to steam power as the main source of railway traction for considerably longer than many other Western countries, and it made the whole network feel old-fashioned and slow. The United States and Germany had embraced mainline diesel and electric locomotion as far back as the 1930s, whilst Britain's experiments in that field were limited at best. But British Rail had a few stumbling blocks to overcome before they could achieve this modernisation plan. Mainly the stumbling block of not actually having a massive fleet of diesel locomotives to replace steam traction with. And those regional politics I mentioned a few moments ago from the previous old Big Four railway companies was also going to be a major factor. You see, those companies may have ceased to be in 1948, but the same people in the same organisations were still responsible for the same jobs. It's not like the culture of those regions suddenly disappeared overnight just because British Rail was on the nameplate instead of, say, the LNER. And it was this that was going to prove to be quite important in the procuring of prototypes of diesel locomotives. The great example of this is the fiercely independent Great Western Railway that became the western region of British Rail, insisted on having nothing to do with diesel electric locomotives and they instead wanted to modernise with diesel hydraulic locomotives. And the South East, which had been the old Southern Railway, had its own particular needs. They were electrifying their entire network but the electrification wasn't complete yet, so they still needed a few diesel locomotives to fill the gaps, but they didn't particularly need them to have bells and whistles. The northern regions had the most wide-ranging need for diesels. They needed things that could do long-range express routes. They needed things that could do mixed traffic. And this would prove to be vital for the Type 3s. British Rail broke down their requirements for the prototypes into power bands, ranging initially from Type 1, at the lowest power bracket, to Type 4, the most powerful, later adding Type 5 when it became clear that the Type 4s that were on offer weren't coming close to the power and speed that were needed to replace the old A4 Pacifics. This was the class of steam locomotive that the well-known steam speed record holder Mallard belonged to. At first, very little attention was given to Type 3 as it was assumed that Type 2s would be adequate for branch line freight and passengers, and the new multiple units would be taking up most mid-range passenger trains. Part of the problem was that the Type 4s, the early Type 4s, of which the English Electric Class 40 was a preeminent model, were not performing quite as intended. They had been expected to run high-speed intercity passenger express trains and pull heavy freight, and while the freight wasn't particularly a problem, the high-speed nature was. The Class 40 itself was underpowered and overweight, having to have an extra axle fitted to its bogies during design because many of the components from external places were coming in far heavier than intended. This limited the amount of the network that the Class 40 could run on, and an unfortunate later discovery of an epidemic of cracked bogies among the class certainly didn't help its matters much. But the northwestern region in their days as the London, Midland and Scottish had actually been quite progressive on the idea of diesel-electric traction on their main lines. In the 1940s, they entered into a collaboration with English Electric to produce a pair of prototypes known as 10,000 and 10,001. The family resemblance to later English Electric models will be quite obvious. These two locomotives had been planned to be mixed traffic locos, pulling goods trains and pulling mainline express trains. The idea being to produce a locomotive like the American diesel electrics of the day that could be the face of intercity traction. Now these locos came very late in the day for the LMS. One was delivered in LMS livery, the second only a few months later was delivered in British Rail livery. But the experiment paid off because these two locos were really successful, they were very good at what they did and they were pretty reliable which was 
basically all the tick boxes that needed to be checked for dependable mainline express use. The only problem was that they were effectively what British Rail would later class as Type 3 and they weren't seen as being quite as powerful, being only 1600 horsepower as opposed to the 2000 of the class 40s. But they're relatively lightweight and the fact that they could work in tandem to produce as much tractive effort as a much heavier and much more powerful locomotive was certainly very appealing and British Rail did start to think about revisiting the Type 3 specification as an option for mixed freight use. This pair was so successful that they convinced British Rail heads that dieselisation would be possible in the long-term plan to eradicate steam from the network. And it would be this design that English Electric would look to when it came to designing their own mass production Type 3 and the family resemblance of the Class 37 to this old pair of 1940s prototypes is quite obvious. The curved roof and bonnet were themselves nods to the early American diesel-electric mainline locomotives. Now, maybe it's partly down to the fact that the Type 3 of all the specifications was much more based on regional need, and maybe it was down to the fact that English Electric was had a standard reputation for producing really high-quality mass-produced diesel locos, but the Class 37 didn't go through a prototype phase. It went straight to full production with an order of 42 locomotives being placed and arriving just before Christmas in 1960. And it wasn't long before the performance of these new locos was noted by the other regions. The northeastern region started ordering them and the western region for various different reasons which we'll go into in another video started to uh, go a little bit sour on diesel hydraulic locomotives. The Class 37 was at 1750 horsepower, only marginally less powerful than the Class 40 before it, and considerably lighter, with a route availability of 5, which meant that it could cover much of the network. It became a mixed traffic engine of choice, pulling both short-range passenger trains, long-range intercity passenger trains, and both light and heavy freight. The fact that, like the Class 20, it had really good standard multiple working meant that you could daisy chain a couple of 37s together to pull much heavier trains. And whilst it was never going to be a speed king on the intercity express lines, that's fine because it wasn't intended to be in the first place. What it was intended to be was a replacement for those mixed traffic engines, the steam locomotives like the Stanier Black 5s for instance, which were basically one of the most successful mixed traffic locos of all time until the Class 37. Another feather in the cap of the Class 37 when it comes to its flexibility for passenger use came in the form of the fact that it was supplied as standard with a steam boiler. And if you don't know much about locomotives, you're probably wondering why a diesel locomotive would need a steam boiler. But the reason is that in the 1960s, much of the coaching stock was old stuff that had been inherited from the pre-grouping companies. They weren't set up for electric train heating. They were heated by pipes carrying steam from the steam engine underneath the coaches and around them. And diesel locomotives generally didn't produce steam, they produced electricity to run on. So in order to heat these coaches, these diesel locomotives from the early days needed to carry a steam boiler. And this was much, much preferred for locomotives in Scotland, for instance, where the temperature was always a little bit chilly. It allowed the 37s to become incredibly popular north of the border, as well as during wintertime runs across the rest of the country. By contrast, in the southern region, their Class 33 had been effectively built by fitting a larger engine into a Class 25 body to keep it cheap, but that was at the expense of taking out the steam boiler. If the Class 33 wanted to run wintertime trains and heat the steam-heated coaches, it needed to run in multiple with a Class 25, which was literally just there for the steam boiler. The Class 37 could do it in one. And when it comes to the enthusiasts, there is the sound. There's nothing quite like the Class 37. Its homegrown English electric plant and the later replacements by Brush are loud, growly and inspired enthusiasts to nickname them tractors in the early days. But it's more than that. I live right next to a railway line and every time a Class 37 comes by pulling the railhead treatment train, it's a sound you can feel as much as you can hear. 
and it's so much louder than the normal sprinters. Really is kind of one of the reasons why I consider this to be one of my favourite diesel locomotives of them all. It's just awesome. I love the 37, what can I say? 37s gave sterling service in operation, becoming one of a handful of diesel locos that stayed in active service right up to the modern day. The later and also excellent Brush Type 4, the Class 47, may have taken away much of the 37's long-distance intercity passenger work, but the sheer utility of the 37's was hard to match. There were several attempts to give 37's greater power and extend their lives by replacing the engine with higher rated ones made by Merleys and Ruston, although this did affect the route availability, making these variants known as the 37-9 heavier. Another variant, the Slash 4, had their main generators replaced by a brush model and were fitted with electric train heating, which obviously was important for wintertime passenger services with modern coaching stock, especially in Scotland. Even today, in the 2020s, these locos are still being used, here pulling railhead treatment trains, there pulling the occasional passenger service in rural regions in East Anglia and the West. Plenty are in preservation the reliability and usefulness being as attractive to heritage lines as they have been for 60 years on the main line. The Class 37 must rank as one of English Electric's greatest success stories. Yeah, sure, the Class 20 was produced in huge numbers, over 200 of them being made, but their duties were largely freight, which meant that they weren't a common sight throughout the stations of the nation. Likewise, the Class 55 Deltics, whilst being high-profile, high-speed intercity express locomotives, with a fleet of only 22, were actually comparatively small, just a tiny drop in the ocean compared to the 37s. For a good chunk of the last half century, the Class 37s have ruled the rails alongside the Class 47. And even now, after their prime, they're still clinging on in areas across the network and for particular types of rail service. 60 years after the first models rolled off the production line. And if that's not a success story, then I don't know what is. The Class 37. Strong, flexible, dependable. The absolute gold standard of the really useful engine.